Not so long ago, this area, Lu Jiazui, was all farmland, with just a few run-down warehouses along the river bank. Today, 30 years later, its skyline has become an internationally recognized symbol of China's transformation into an economic and financial powerhouse. Much less well-known is something which happened here in July 1921, just as the Communist Party's first Congress was meeting on the other side of the river. Led by local communists, the farm workers who grew and cured the tobacco crop on the land where those skyscrapers now stand, rebelled against the gangers who made them work in appalling conditions. They won a pay rise. It was one of the first successes of China's new labor movement. This is the former site of the Secretariat of the China Labor Association. In Chinese, the name sounds rather cumbersome because it derives from a term for trade unions used in Japan. The Secretariat was established in August 1921, barely a month after the party was founded, with the aim of setting up a network of labor unions all over China. Contemporary documents show the association campaigning for an eight-hour working day, a minimum wage, and basic welfare and security for the workforce. Things which everyone takes for granted today, but which at that time the workers could only dream of. The Secretariat was collecting signatures for a petition to the Northern Warlord Government in Beijing, urging it to enact a labor code giving the workers proper protection. First to sign was a communist organizer, Deng Jungsha. That was the moment almost a hundred years ago when the labor movement and the Communist Party became intimately linked, just as Shanghai was developing into one of the world's great workshops. A hundred years ago, there was a huge and very rapid expansion in global trade. All along the Huangpu River and Suzhou Creek, there was a continuous row of factories, the vestiges of which can still be seen today. Following China's devastating defeat by Japan in 1895, the Qing Empire had been forced to sign the Treaty of Shimonoseki, which granted Japanese businessmen unconditional rights to establish industrial plants, both here in Shanghai and in all the other Chinese ports open to foreign trade without the Chinese authorities having any control over what they did. Capital flooded in from Western countries too, as Europeans and Americans saw the chance to make money. The policies which successive dynasties had followed for centuries, keeping foreigners at arm's length and protecting China from their influence, came to an abrupt end. The low cost of Chinese labor and lax regulation were also powerful incentives for foreign businessmen. Japanese factories, for instance, relocated to China to avoid having to obey recently passed Japanese laws protecting workers' rights and banning the use of child labor. In theory, child labor was illegal in China too, but China was under the sway of the warlords who ruled by violence and armed force and had no time for the rule of law. Since there was no legal protection, there was no limit to the exploitation. The main currency in China in the 1920s was struck from silver ingots like these, which you can see in the photo behind me, being put on a carrying pole by a group of porters on the Bund. Some factory owners, Chinese as well as foreign, came up with a clever trick to reduce wages still further, naturally at the workers' expense. This silver dollar is called a big head because it depicts Yuan Shikai, who usurped power in Beijing after the fall of the empire. These small coins are made of copper. The factory owners didn't pay the workers in dollars, they paid them in the copper coins instead. The value of the copper coins fluctuated. On wage day, it might take 1,600 of them to make a silver dollar 
but a few days later the value would fall to 1800. This is the West Shanghai Workers' Culture Palace, which was built later to commemorate the Workers' Club which the Communists established here, soon after the party was founded, to promote adult literacy. Back in the 1920s, the workers suffered not just from low wages, but from a lack of education. The Communists decided that the first step towards emancipating labour was to teach them how to read and write. Then, after the Fourth Party Congress in January 1925, the Communists focused on building up party membership in the labor associations, and many prominent Communist leaders came to give lectures here, among the textile mills of Shaoshadu. At one such textile plant, the Japanese No. 7 mill, an incident occurred which marked a turning point in the labor movement, triggering what became known as the May 30th incident. A Japanese Taipan shot dead a young strike leader, 20-year-old Gu Jong Hong. 10,000 people attended his funeral. A week later, massive protests broke out against the Western powers. On May the 30th, more than 100 demonstrators were arrested. And when the crowd demanded their release, British police in the international settlement opened fire, killing 13 people and wounding dozens of others. The massacre on May the 30th set China on fire. Workers, students, ordinary people, all united in anger against the foreigners and against the weakness of the warlord government which had failed to defend their rights. Support for the Communist Party rocketed from fewer than a thousand in 1924 to 50,000 a year later. Reform and revolution became the slogans of the day. But hopes of change proved false. In Shanghai, much worse was to come. <laughs>